And I'm questioning everything. Not just stereotypes of MA drivers, but everything. Is it really air I'm breathing? Am I wearing pants or are pants wearing me? Hey crew, I've got the key to that 23 BMW M8 Coupe. We are gonna take it for a drive, but first, let's check it out how it looks on the inside and outside. The only updates for 23 to the exterior are not really relevant for the M8, because on the regular 8 series, there's a slightly revised grille with new grille slats, and it's illuminated. Again, not relevant for us. We do have the M 50th Anniversary Edition badges here, and the exterior carbon package gives us some carbon fiber here and some carbon fiber there. There are the LED matrix headlights with LED turn signals. This one is painted in Imola red, which is something you could do, not something I would necessarily do. At the side, we find a set of 20 inch two-tone alloy wheels contrasted by those gold painted calipers, meaning we have the optional carbon ceramic brakes. The tires are Pirelli P0s, 275 section front and 285 at the rear. There's some additional carbon fiber for these non-functional vents and for the mirror caps. And because the competition package is included on every 23M8, you get the carbon fiber roof. The profile shows off that long hood, a touch of flare from the wheels, and a gentle taper from that roof line. Here at the back is a carbon fiber diffuser with four large blacked out exhaust ports, a carbon fiber lip spoiler, and slender LED taillights and turn signals. The overall look of the M8 Coupe, it just exudes success. It's pure executive transport. My question for you, it's a throwback. Which looks better, the M6 Coupe or this M8 Coupe? Let me know in the comments and let's check out the interior. Opening up and looking inside at this Silverstone colored full leather interior, that is an upgrade. The front seats are heated, ventilated, power adjusting, including the side bolsters. They've got three positions of memory. The M8 logo is illuminated as is the M8 competition tread plate. There are aluminum foot pedals. The full leather package means the entire door panel is in leather. We've got two one touch windows, power adjusting and power folding door mirrors. Push this button down to release the power operated trunk lid and inside find a generous 13 cubic feet of space. Yes, it's very deep and you can pull on these two tabs to fold down those rear seats. There's a power close and lock function on the trunk lid. Harman Kardon 16 speaker sound system is standard as is the suede wrapped headliner. To get to the second row, pull on this tab and the seat will power slide forward. But the second row seating, uh, you'd have to beg me to get back there. Well, seems like your begging worked, though don't take this to mean that I've got legroom. This seat could not slide back to my driving position at six feet tall, and I have no headroom. Head is on the roof, would not recommend for any adults or even kids. And there aren't even any amenities back here. No air vents, no climate control, no USB ports, no armrest. Now back where I belong in the driver's seat, I'll close up the door to listen for the door close noise. Really solid, even with frameless windows. The steering wheel is thick in the hands. We've got the tricolor on the inside, it's heated. We've got paddles on the back of the wheel, though they are plasticky. Red M1 and M2 buttons, customizable, digital gauge cluster, head up display, stitched leather up on the dashboard, and new for 23 is a larger 12.3 inch touchscreen. It is running the last generation of iDrive, though it's still responsive and has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Beneath that screen are physical climate and media settings. There's gloss ashwood trim that we slide for to find a wireless charging pad and USB-A port. Your drive selections are here. There's a neural dial to control your infotainment system if you don't want to touch the screen. Leather top in the console and inside is a good bit of storage with a USB-C port. Visibility is quite good with a nice large piece of back glass and there's standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic. And headroom for myself up front is excellent. That gets the thumbs up from me. And this cabin overall is just pure business class with just a hint of sport. Now it's time to take the M8 Coupe for a drive. All right, let's fire it up. Quick punch from the V8 on startup. Well, before we do anything else, I just have to show you this. When I discover things like this, I can't help but share my enthusiasm. So the sun visor, not that small, but look at the vanity mirror. Look how tiny that thing is, hello. Just the sense of humor I have, I'm a child. Hello, cabin crew. Thank you for joining me for this drive. 
in the 23 BMW M8 Coupe drive mode. We're gonna select that here, hit the setup button, and we should begin in efficient setting, and let's leave everything else in the comfort settings. Then over and up to go into reverse, that brings up a high resolution camera system. We have a lot of different camera angles to choose from. Got a bird's eye view. We've got a 3D projection. You can scan around the whole exterior. And they even gave it to us in the same color as our car. I'm a sucker for that stuff. And then we'll go back to parking view and I'll hit the backup assist, which will take us out of the space, doing the steering for me in the same path along the same path I used to get into it. And that's enough. Thank you, BMW, for showing off your little tricks. Turning radius test to start. Wheel cranked. Man, that's, that's so good you'd swear this thing had rear wheel steering, but it doesn't. Turn signal sound. I find comfort in a familiar tone, a classic BMW turn signal tune. Now the world famous horn test, sounds like an old timey motor bus. I don't know why, but it does. Powertrain in the BMW M8, I said before that all new M8s have that competition package as standard. So that means we've got a 4.4 liter twin turbo V8 that makes the full 617 horsepower. No more of this 600 horsepower garbage. What is that? Come on, 600 horsepower. And 553 pound feet of torque. That is routed through an eight speed torque converter, automatic and sent to all four tires via a rear wheel drive biased all wheel drive system and you can make that rear wheel drive biased all wheel drive system 100% rear biased. And I'm just gonna give you a quick demonstration of what that looks like. Now to convert the M8 into rear drive form, just make sure traction control is all the way off and your MX drive is in two wheel drive. You can also just do that in one of your M modes and just now add a little bit of flavor. Yes, yes, indeed, it can absolutely hoon. Now, if you wanted to drive more like an adult, which I know nothing about, you can do that and have the all-wheel drive grip in all weather conditions, and that's great. The eight-speed automatic is also an excellent gearbox. It's very smooth in the working between the gears and the power delivery. It is gradual in efficient mode, but considerable, just builds up. And if there's any hesitance in the throttle, then it's because of the throttle mapping. It's not really because of the twin turbo setup building boost more slowly. No, it's, it's just how you change the modes. Because if we go into the sport even, not chassis, what are we doing? Comfort chassis, sport throttle response, then it perks up immediately. So it's just throttle mapping there. And the seat comfort just reinforces the smoothness of the M8 because they're so supple and they contour perfectly to my body. And they're so adjustable that any body type is gonna find, well, almost any body type, is gonna find a driving position, driving seating position that is just right for them. The braking takes a little getting used to. The last inch or so of brake pedal pressure yield some grabby response from the brakes. So you have to be very finessed with your foot application of the braking, but you can get used to it. It's just not something you can do sort of secondhand when first hopping behind the wheel. And that's not the only thing that doesn't earn the M8 a full perfect score for comfort. The ride quality in this vehicle is a bit stiff. To the point that I wouldn't ever really take it out of the comfort chassis when not doing anything like ripping through a canyon road because the coil springs and adjusting dampers in the M8 lean towards firmness. You jostle around on uneven terrain and the impacts from a crack or bump or what have you are felt as pulses 
in through your seat and occasionally over a really rough bump, they're very jarring and you can hear those imperfections too. So your brain is telling you, this is gonna hurt, even if it's not quite as bad as it seems. The good news is that if your commute is primarily on the highway, then you're not gonna care quite as much about the around town discomfort because the M8 is built to cover a lot of ground very quickly at relative ease. So it settles in at highway velocity, showing off its cabin insulation. I'm gonna quiet up now, and we're going to listen for the NVH level. And we have driving aids to ease our commute further, like the driving assistance pro packages, steering assistance, which will follow the curvature of the lane, keeping you in the center, asking you to check in with your hands. It's not really a hands-free system. I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. This does not have the lane change assist feature or the full hands-free driving that the latest and greatest BMWs are offering, like the new 7 Series. But it's still something to just put you more at ease. But easy gets boring after a while. Sometimes you're going to want launch control, which we're going to do right now with my race box set up here to record our real-world 0-60 to test facing a slight uphill right now. Just keep that in mind. To use launch control, you're going to need to go into the manual mode with the shift logic in three. Then you'll need to turn dynamic stability control completely off and you'll want to be in the Sport Plus engine response. You can do all that manually or have it programmed into one of your M buttons, which I have here. So M1 is locked in. I'm now going to hold my foot hard on the brake while pinning the throttle, building up the rest for launch control, which is active and oh, what the? <laughs> 3, 3.2 seconds to 60 on an uphill. Are you kidding me? And if you think that's spicy, according to independent tests like Car and Driver, if we were on a flat surface in ideal conditions for launch, we'd see zero to 60 in the mid to high two second range. That is wild. And we can thank the all wheel drive grip off the lawn for that ludicrous launch. I didn't clarify, and you're probably wondering why I didn't shift it all for launch control. That's because the manual mode that you go into for launch only really comes into play after, after, after the launch. So we are in manual now, but I want to see how the automatic mode behaves. So I'm clicking this over and then dialing up the shift logic to three, but everything else about the car is in the most aggressive setting. So the chassis, the braking, the steering, and the engine to let us have a little bit of fun and see what the M8 can do. It already sounds a lot better than before. Carbon ceramics have a nice bite to them. Oh my gosh! Holy cow! I was just in the 670 horsepower Corvette Z06, and I swear this is just as quick, maybe even quicker, down that straightaway than that car was. This has a worse power to weight ratio as well. Feels incredibly flat through the corners. Gearbox hesitated a little bit there. My goodness, the shove out of a corner is unbelievable. So it's divvying up the power front to rear really well and then side to side at the back with that limited slip differential. So you just launch out of the back end of a corner. Unreal. You get to that braking point so fast. And that's when the carbon ceramics really just come in so necessary for something like this. poise from the body. The steering is very, very quick, but the feel through the wheel is too light for me. 
it just doesn't seem to load up appropriately in corners. It's heavy enough for sure, but the building of resistance doesn't carefully communicate the weight transfer side to side. And when you've got 4,250 pounds, you need to know what's happening with it. I can clearly discern that the grip from these Pirelli P0s is excellent. Not even that wide, 275 section front, 285 at the rear. Not crazy wide, but a good compound and aided by the geometry of all-wheel drive. A real weapon on these roads. Controllable and quick. The only thing there, again, the gearbox sometimes seems a little confused. Could be the torque converter as opposed to a dual clutch that's going to shift quicker. But it's also down to the calibration because I was just in that Cayenne Turbo GT and that's a torque converter. But it shifted so quickly and so intelligently that you couldn't tell. The straight line speed. Brake early, friends. Because by the time you're done with your straight, you're going to be going fast. I am curious to see if I can cure some of my quibbles with this gearbox by controlling it myself. So I am going into manual mode now, clicking the selector over and operating the paddles, choosing when and how to change the gear. is well disguised. I gotta say that. And that just gives you confidence even if the steering isn't giving you feel. My goodness. Yes, manual mode is helping a lot. Creating a more favorable impression because the gearbox is quick. And because it doesn't do anything odd like auto upshift for you. So when you can plot your own gear changes, you can extract more out of this car than even the transmission in auto mode. Now we're living, baby, right here on a Great Canyon Road. It has transformed. I'll admit, kinda didn't understand it until now. And I still have a few questions. But it's not about how it does this stuff. It's not about how far behind people are going to trail you who are attempting to catch up, who are attempting to keep pace. This is vicious. No mercy. I misjudged this car. And now I feel a little bad. And I'm questioning everything. Not just stereotypes of MA drivers, but everything. Is it really air I'm breathing? Am I wearing pants or are pants wearing me? And that is gonna lead me into my miles per hour word of the day, which for the 23 BMW M8 Coupe is duplicitous, meaning deceitful or misleading. Cause this car tricked me, it tricked me good. It just looks like a luxury coupe with a little extra carbon fiber. But to come to find out, that it's really a sports sportering on supercar in disguise. Cause you get up, you drive it, you go, wow, this rod is really firm. Why would they do that for your average luxury coupe? That doesn't make any sense. And then you start pushing it and you see, oh, it's actually just an animal. 
an absolute animal. Which leads me to my public service announcement, which is, unless you're actually driving a supercar, like a Ferrari 296 or a McLaren 720S, don't challenge one of these. Mid-range or from a dick, don't do it because it's just gonna embarrass you. This thing is too fast. Now, of course, we do need to discuss pricing and competition. We'll get there. Just first, let's discuss top speed and fuel economy. The top speed of the M8 without the driver's package is 155 miles per hour, but we have that here, so it's 189 miles per hour. The fuel economy is 15 mpg in the city, 22 on the highway, and 17 combined. The starting figure for the 23 M8 Coupe is $136,000, but this one, as tested, is 158 grand. Alternatives. In this sports GT segment, we've got vehicles like the Lexus LC500 that starts at just $96,000. It makes 471 horsepower. It gets to 60 in 4.7 seconds, has a top speed of 168 miles per hour and fuel economy of 19 combined. There is the Jaguar F-Type R that starts at $114,000. It makes 575 horsepower, gets to 60 in 3.6 seconds, has a top speed of 186 miles per hour and fuel economy of 18 combined. Or the Porsche 911T that starts at $118,000. It makes 379 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.3 seconds, has a top speed of 181 miles per hour and fuel economy of 21 combined. So the BMW is the most expensive, but it also makes the most power. And in the real world, it's just gonna dust all of those cars in almost every environment. But what you are giving up, two things. One, your fuel economy. It's not just 17 mpg. I just obliterated the fuel tank. And the ride quality, I'll return to around town if you're using this car a lot, just grocery getting or whatever. That's gonna get old, just bopping around as much as you are and feeling the pulses of road imperfections in through to your back. And I just don't think the look is, well, as intoxicating as even the Lexus LC500 or as classic as the Porsche 911 for thousands less. So for me, this is, yes, your one-stop shop if you wanna absolutely kill it in real world speed. But if you want to layer in ride comfort and style for a lot less money, my vote is the Lexus LC500. Or if you want just the most rewarding driver's car with better steering than this, then the Porsche 911T would get my verdict. Which are you going to choose, though? Is it the BMW M8? Is it the Porsche 911T? Is it the Lexus LC500 or that Jaguar F-Type R? Let me know in the comments. I hope you guys have enjoyed this POV drive review. If you did, please like, comment, and share it. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell to get notified like I'm hitting the M1 button right now. And I will see you again next time. Oof. Overrun. Thank you. Wow.